doing, sir? Oh, dude, it's just 2020 up in this bitch. All <laughs> over it. Just 2020 everywhere. Got it. Uh, I really do have a bunch of questions, so let's see what we can do. Um, so I'm going to start with the most important question, which is always the way I want to start every interview off. Um, will the character of Gabriel Edwards be making an appearance on the Gossip Girl reboot? Uh, if that happens, I will literally eat your shoe. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Got it. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, that's an early work for you. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I mean, you know, pays the bills, gets you experience. You got to start somewhere. You know, hundred percent. Um, got, got my ass to New York. You know, that's fine. That's fine. I got to work in New York for a bit. Exactly. Um, the next most important question, and I actually this is a real question. What do you and I have to do to get Tom Ford to make more movies? Dude, I know, I know. You know what? It's so funny. He's such a creative genius uh, in every single aspect that he applies his creativity. But the problem with Tom Ford is his bandwidth of creativity is so large that he has so much shit he can be a genius on. So yep. getting him to sit down and focus on any one of them is probably really tough. I'm sure the people in the cologne line, and I mean, you've smelled his colognes, are like, hey, man, we'd love more work over here. And the people in the clothes, and you've seen his clothes, they're like, hey, but we need your attention too. Everybody wants some attention. I think he's made two films and they're both fantastic. They're both incredible. I mean, the fact Single Man was like his uh, first film ever, and it was actually a piece of art. I mean, it's just incredible. No, we're on the same page. I, this is yeah. actually a sincere question. That yeah. was very, very sincere. I don't know. I don't know. But if you figure it out, let me know what I can do to help. Got it. Uh, what TV series would you love to guest star on? Ooh, uh, dude, you know what? I've, I've been getting into TV shows that I missed, that I didn't see because I was too busy or whatever. And now because of this, like I have more time. Uh I just watched an episode of Workaholics last night where Ben Stiller was the guest star. I'm not even joking. And I was like, that's Ben Stiller. And he, and then Ben Stiller got into a front yard wrestling match with these guys uh, and beat the shit out of them on the show. And I was like, this looks amazing. Like Workaholics is the show that I'm into right now. I'm like, I'm just about to finish Workaholics and I'm so bummed because I feel like I'm going to lose three buddies. What movie do you think you've seen the most? It would either be the first Matrix, Cool Hand Luke, or Fight Club, probably in that order. Do you remember your first movie or TV show crush? First movie or TV show crush. Dude, do you remember, I was thinking about this show the other day. Uh, do you remember a show that was set in Santa Monica about bike police on the ocean, like on, on the boardwalk? This is how long ago this was. It was on USA Network back when that was like a thing. I should know this, but I don't I don't know the name. I don't remember the name either, but there was like a blonde chick on there who rode a bicycle and I think I was like 13 and going through puberty and I was like, right. "Yep, this is all this is it for me. This is Wait, my no, I, that, Yeah, no, I I completely understand that. Um Pacific Blue. Pacific Blue. Someone just jumped in. Do you see it down there? Thank you, Kyle. Pacific Blue. Oh, my God. I've been trying to remember the name of that show for probably four years. And I don't know how many times I typed Bike Police, Santa Monica TV show. And, like, he couldn't get anything. Pacific Blue. Okay. Uh, <laughs> back to the important things. People ask you this all the time. And I've asked you this all the time. And I'm still going to ask you this. Yeah. Um, obviously, I love Man From U.N.C.L.E. And just like everybody else who's seen it. Um, so what do we need to do to get more? And, and I, here's my pitch. If someone were to write some fan fiction or yeah. like some quasi animated thing, would, would you be willing to voice it? And then we could just try to ask Henry to do it too. I mean, it, I would do another man from uncle in a heartbeat, like in a heartbeat. Uh, if someone wrote a really good piece of fanfic, I'd narrate it. Uh, if someone wrote an extremely good piece of fanfic, I would make sure it got to fucking Guy and Lionel and be like, you guys need to read this and then give this person co-writing credit because let's just get this movie made. Let's just do this. Look, I I'm all in on that. I think that movie is criminally underrated. And uh, that's why I keep on bringing it up because people need to watch it. Yeah. I mean, it was so much fun to make. Honestly, it's one of the movies... I mean, apart obviously from like calling me by your name, it's one of the movies that I get the most messages about. People just being like, I want another one of those. What do we do? No, 100%. Speaking of call me by your name, the best film of that year. Uh, obviously, like everyone, I want to get a sequel to it. And I know you guys want to make one, but I also think that 
one of the things about that movie is you really need like years to pass in real life to almost make the movie, the sequel resonate because yeah. you need to have like lines in your face. Like oh, I'm getting there. I mean, I'm get, I'm getting there. Right, I'm aging, you know, Steve, I'm aging like milk in a warm car, buddy. Come on. What did, I haven't noticed that. See if I can get all these grays in there. I, I haven't noticed that. But do you but do you agree with that? That like even yeah. though everyone's talking about it, I think it needs like 10 years before, yeah. you know. It needs room to breathe too. I mean, so many people are emotionally invested in the first Call Me By Your Name that if you release a second one now, no matter what, I feel like you're just setting yourself up for failure. Uh, if you give us time and, you know, I mean, like the like the story is supposed to happen, if you give us that time and then we can come back, you know, when I'm in my 40s, you know, and Timmy's 23, you know, <laughs> then we could do it again then, you know. Right. No, I just think it's important people talk about that, that it's just not going to work if you do it like next year. A hundred percent. Agreed. Agreed. I completely yeah. agree. Jumping into why I actually get to talk to you today. Uh, yeah. What you, so you're presented with this, either Ben calls you, someone's handing you a script. Are you at, at first like, wait, you want to re redo Hitchcock? What? Wait, what? That was exactly my reaction. And Ben was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. Sure. Like, you know, you're the director, you're the boss. If you feel good about it, I feel good about it. How would you compare this one to the Hitchcock version uh, for fans that maybe have seen the original? This is exactly how I would put it. Uh, the Hitchcock version was the fastest car in 1940. That's the year it came out. It was the fastest car. It won Best Picture, like literally the fastest car in this analogy. If you made exactly that same car now or tried to replicate that car now, it would be atrocious. It wouldn't have power steering. It wouldn't have power brakes. It wouldn't have seat belts. It wouldn't have anything that modern cars are required to have just so that we don't die, right? And also it wouldn't drive as well. I think uh, if you go back and watch the Hitchcock film for 1940, it is an incredible piece of art. But personally, I think it aged a little less gracefully than a lot of Hitchcock's other work. I mean, Rear Window is prescient as fuck. Uh, Rope, uh, Psycho, Birds, like all those things. You know, then you go back and you watch Rebecca and it looks like a set, crazy, intense lighting, very kind of polarized light and dark. Um, and, it, you know, I, I think that what Ben wanted to do was instead of saying we're remaking Hitchcock, we, we did exactly what Hitchcock did, which is we took the book and we adapted the book. Uh, we weren't thinking about Hitchcock's version. We weren't trying to emulate anything that Hitchcock did. We were going back to the original source material, just like Hitchcock did. And he made changes in the original source material. He changed the way Rebecca died. He changed he changed some big things in the movie. And we wanted to stay more true to the original source material. Uh, and that's what we did. As I was watching it, you guys had a lot of like long singular takes. Um, yeah. And so, and it felt like it, you guys were going for this like 1940s kind of feel um, or just like yeah. a, a different kind of feel. Can you talk when yeah. you're as an actor, when you're on set, how cognizant are you of the choices that the director is making with the lens and with the shots and how much are you yeah. sort of like, just focused on your, um, you know, your performance. I mean, I guess it depends on the actor, really. It, it's probably pretty subjective. I, I'm, I'm like, I like to be hyper aware of those kinds of things. Like, I want to know exactly what lens you put on there. I want to know why. I want to know what camera movement you're doing. I want to know everything uh, because I want to, I want to learn how to do that. Like, I, I, I would like to direct films one day. So for me, it's very important to learn, you know, uh, what a 75 millimeter lens looks like you know, through a camera. I, I, I want to know these things. So when he says, oh no, we've got it. We've got a 50 on there. I go, oh, okay. So then, so then your frame should be about right here. And he'll go, yeah. And I go, okay, cool. So then I'll make sure to hold the thing here and I'll do this and blah, blah, blah. You know who I learned that from? Uh, uh, Johnny Depp was the first person I ever saw do this. And it blew me away. We were standing in front of the camera and he had like something that he was supposed to hold in his hand. And we were just about to roll and he stops and he looks at the camera operator, this guy named Martin. And he goes, Martin, what, what, what lens are you on? And Martin goes, ah, it's, uh, it's uh, 75, Johnny. And he goes, oh, okay, well, then I'll, I'll hold it right here. And he literally brought it up to exactly the perfect place in frame without <clears throat> looking at a monitor. Like, it wasn't like he was looking at the thing and went, okay, I'll bring it right there. It's like he literally said, that's a 75? Okay, there, that's where it'll go. And it was the perfect spot. And I just remember being blown away. Just being like, this guy, 
this guy knows his shit, man. And I'd rather be that guy. So, but then again, there's some actors who don't want to think about that. Like they don't want to be thinking about the camera at all. They don't want to be thinking about tech stuff. They just want to be focused on what they're doing. And that works too. If you get to direct a movie, what is the genre you want to play in? I don't know because like genre is pretty fluid, right? Like, you know, I mean, this, this movie, just Rebecca, it feels like it's got like three different genres that are all kind of like mingling together, you know, in it inside like sort of like the holistic picture. So for me, it's more about, I love the idea of like uh, of, of a good like hero's journey in the Joseph Campbell sense, you know, whether it's a reluctant hero or like a failed journey or what, but like, I just, I like the idea of classic storytelling. Uh, and so it would probably be something in that thing. Are you close to directing or is it something that like you're still building towards? I'm probably closer than I would like to admit, but like, I'm still, it's a big step and I still, you know, it's like Indiana Jones with that big like leap of faith, right? Where he's got to cross that gorge and he doesn't see the, the fucking st- bridge there. I, that's kind of where I'm at, where it's like, look, at this point, like I've been on sets for, you know, 15 years. I've been paying attention to everything directors do and bothering the shit out of DPs for 15 years. Just being like, why that light? Why this? Why that? Why that? So, I mean, I feel like I've accumulated the knowledge. It's just about having the having the confidence to go, yeah, you know what? Let's just do it. Fuck it. Why not? I'm a big fan of Sam Esmail. Um, yep. And so what's the status of Gaslit? Uh, we're, we're supposed or- to go next year. So what can you tell people about it? Uh, I play John Dean and it's the story of the Watergate scandal. Uh, it's the story of corrupt politicians. It's the story of uh, lying to the public. It's the story about getting caught. It's the story about accountability. It's a story about all of this and it'll have uh, Sean Penn and Julia Roberts in it. So what's not to love? Yeah, no actors. I know, I know, yeah. No me, actors. me steadily bringing up the rear on that one. I don't think that's true actually. Uh, uh, I like the humbleness, but uh, uh, you, you you have game. Right. Um, right, so I, listen, I think one of the most important things going on right now is dealing with the opioid epidemic. I think yep. that it is a massive problem that is under, even though we talk about it, it's still yep. underserved. You know, yep. it's still a huge issue. Uh, you have a, a movie coming out called Dreamland, which yep. deals with that head on. Um, yep. What was it about that project that said, I want to do this and and talk a little bit about it? Well, you know, Nick Jarecki, who directed it, uh, he he's a friend of mine. We've known each other for a long time. And he came to me and he said, hey, man, listen, I've, I'm, I've got this movie. Uh, it's, a, it's about the opioid crisis. And I've... I've almost lost multiple friends to opioid addictions, whether it be, you know, heroin or pills or a mixture of both. Um, and it, it is, it is a massive epidemic that we are dealing with in America that because pharmaceutical medications make so much money, not only for the pharmaceutical companies, but also for lobbyists, also for politicians, also for everyone, uh, we turn a blind eye to this. I mean, the amount of people who die from opioid addictions in America is staggering. Um, And also I read the script and I thought, this is really good. And this is really interesting. And it's really highlighting that this doesn't just affect, you know, this affects everyone. There's there's no one safe from opioid addiction, especially in America where they're so quick to prescribe pills and and also with how easy it is. And also with, with fentanyl, the fact that we've invented this fucking poison called fentanyl that's like a hundred times stronger than morphine and just the littlest tiny sprinkle of it and you'll overdose. And, you know, and this, the, the movie is about a drug ring in Canada that is getting the uh, ingredients for fentanyl sent in from China, processing it, and then shipping the pills down into America. And this is what's happening. This, this happens all the time. You know, I mean, so um, we wanted to make a film about it and show sort of like the stark reality of it. I could keep on going on that, but I also want to talk about Taika's new movie, uh, Next Goal Wins, which yeah. is obviously we're huge Taika fans. And I know you are too. Yeah. Uh, this is this is a completely different movie than I think people are expecting. Yeah. Um, wh- can you tell people what it's about? And also, what was it like having him on set directing? Um, I mean, he's so talented. So talented. I mean, he's 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 phenomenally talented. He's almost too talented for his own good. Uh, but he. It, it's the story of a coach played by played hilariously and perfectly by Michael Fassbender, uh, who goes to kind of like as a dead end job just to kind of get rid of him. They send him down to American Samoa to go coach a soccer team there. 
Uh, and it's about what happens to this coach when he goes down to Samoa to coach a soccer team. Um, it's, it's hilarious and it's fun and it's heartfelt. And there are things in it that are really touching. And uh, like, like all of Taika's films, I mean, like Hunt for the Wilder People, like, you know, I mean, that, that movie is funny and touching and you'll cry and laugh in the same film. And like, that's very Taika, you know, I mean, when he wants to do that, that's what he's going to do. Uh, having him on set is the best, you know, when he's, when he's not sleeping, that is. Um, but uh, uh, actually, his, his napping thing is, is also very impressive. He's got this thing where he'll go, okay, set up this camera over there, set up that over there, set up that over there. How long will that be? And they'll be like, uh, that'll be about three minutes. And he'll go, great. And then he'll be out. And then two minutes and 55 seconds later, he'll go, okay, are the cameras ready? And he's like, what was that? Like, holy shit, man. Um, but he also, his brain works better than everyone else's. So when the whole point of the script, or I'm sorry, when the whole point of the film was a lot of improvisation, he would be there with you. He'd go, okay, now, now go, 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 go down that line. Now talk about this. Okay, now talk about that. Now say this. Now say that. You know, I mean, he's right there helping you and coaching you through this whole thing. And it just makes you feel really safe and really protected. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a lot of fun to work with. On that note, I need to stop. I'm just going to say congrats on everything. Pleasure to see you. Uh, and I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. All right, soon. Good to see you, my man.